Right. Uh, let's start. Um, first, before we start, I just have to make a few announcements. Uh, please keep the pathways leading to the doors clear. That's really important, and uh, uh, we really have to do it in case of an emergency. Someone has to be carried out. Please keep the pathways clear, uh, particularly in here, over here. If you could just like squeeze a bit to that side, that'd be perfect. Uh, same there again, and. Um, Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, that should be fine. Um, also, during the question and answer session, please do not leave. Um, wait till the end, uh, if you've got the time. Uh, that'd be really nice, because it's really annoying uh, for the videotape as well as for the audio. It stays like it's really busy and people are leaving. Uh, if, you, if you really have to leave, leave to the back door, because otherwise you walk directly in front of the video camera that's standing there. Uh, also, keep in mind these cameras because uh, it's really not nice if like people stand in front of them and uh, block the view because everything, as you know, is going to be on the internet uh, and streamed. Um, but that was it about that. And um, as you know, internet banking is easy to use, which is, uh, well, apart from attracting users, it's always uh, attracting, uh, attracted exploiters. And whilst most ex uh, exploits target brain version 1.0, there is lacking important security fixes, uh, such as uh, do not enter pins and tans on strange websites. Uh, others attack more, uh, other attacks are much more sophisticated. And um, Torsten Holtz will tell us more. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot for the introduction and welcome to my talk on banking malware and keyloggers. My name is Thorsten Holtz, I'm a PhD student from the University of Mannheim. Um, so this is something you're probably familiar with. So it's just a common phishing mail, it pretends to come from eBay, it informs you that you have some problems with a recent purchase on eBay and you should click on a certain link that's embedded in the email. So, and if you take a look at the link, it doesn't seem to be legit, so it's um, pointing to somewhere in Russia. So, probably this is something like a scam. So, a classical phishing attack looks from a schematic point of view like the following. We have the victim who does transaction with the uh, online auction site. In our case, this would be e uh, eBay. And in order to authenticate against the online auction site, the victim has some credential. So this is typically something like a username and a password. So the, victims, uh, the victim opens a connection to the online auction site, provides the credentials, this is the typical login step, and then the victim can, for example, purchase something on the online auction site. The attacker uh, wants to get access to those credentials in order to impersonate as the victim against the online auction site. Therefore, what the attacker does, he sends a phishing mail to the victim. This is what we've seen in the slides before. And then the victim is lured into opening an imitation. So here, in, the victim goes to another site that looks like the typical online auction site. So it pretends to be eBay, but in reality, it's just a scam server that's located somewhere in Russia or somewhere else. So the phishing website. Uh, then also asks the victim in order to reveal the credentials, so it asks for username and password, and if the victim is dumb enough to enter those credentials, the credentials are sent to the attacker and he can start to abuse it. So this is the classical phishing attacks that we see since a couple of years. Uh, they are lucrative in practice, but from an attacker's point of view, the main problem is that it's too much effort. So basically the attacker can only get one credential from the victim, so he needs to lure the victim to another site in order to get the credentials for the banking website or to get some other credentials. So this kind of attack is, from an attacker's point of view, not really efficient. So what the attackers started to do recently, so in the last two, three or four years, uh, they are now using malware since this is way more efficient, since you do not uh, only get one credentials from the victim, but you can get tens or even more credentials from just one single infection. Um, from a schematic point of view, keylogger-based attacks look like the following. So the attacker somehow gets the keylogger to the victim. Um, keylogger is just a simple malware program that records the keystrokes. Uh, we will have some examples of how those keyloggers look in practice later on. 
then the keylogger basically observes the behavior of the victim. For example, if the victim goes to a banking website, uh, the keylogger records the uh, authentication, uh, the account number together with the password. Or if the victim goes to webmail provider, also the username and the password are recorded. And then uh, those stolen credentials are then sent to the so-called drop zone. Um, a drop zone is simply a server located somewhere in the internet. You can think of it like basically providing some kind of database which collects stolen information. So these, those are typically web servers with a simple PHP web application and um, they basically are the endpoint for the, for the keylogger which just drop the data to the drop zone. And then the attacker can basically access the drop zone and then he gets an overview of what credentials are stolen and he can basically collect all uh, stolen credentials on one side and then start to abuse them. For example, go to the bank and you know, make a transaction or something like this. So this is the type of attack that gets more and more popular recently since it's yeah, the easiest way for an attacker to get yeah, more credentials from just one single infection. So here another uh, email, which is basically one of the things that's behind this. So we see uh, an attack vector that was used from I think probably July until December this year. Uh, basically what they do is they send in a spam mail that pretends to come from UPS. In this example, there are other mails that, come, that pretend to come from FedEx. The story is that a, a packet was supposed, to be was supposed to be delivered to you, but you were not at home. Therefore, UPS sends you an email and within the attachment, you find more information. And of course, there is just malware that you install. But this kind of simple tricks, the simple social engineering is enough in order to infect thousands, tens of thousands of victims. So simple social engineering is still one of the things that's most, uh, most attractive from an attacker's point of view. So I urge you, take a look at your spam mails. You find pretty interesting things there. So do not throw away all your spam, but take a look at it from time to time. And in the rest of the talk, I just um, basically, this is the starting point of my talk, the motivation, and then the rest I'll, t uh, I'll tell you more what's behind this kind of scam mails. Uh, for the outline, in the first part I'll talk about different kind of banking trojans. Uh, Nethel Limbo is one family, uh, it's a more simple one that relies on browser helper objects, which are basically plugins for Internet Explorer. Then as a second example we have Zeus, which is uh, one of the more advanced uh, banking Trojans we see currently in the wild. And then I briefly also mentioned a few other ones since there are probably tens of uh, 10 or 20 families out there that are more prevalent, so that are interesting to study. Um, then in the second part I'll talk more about empirical data, so what we found when studying this kind of keyloggers during the last couple of months and briefly yeah, a conclusion about how you can protect yourself, which will basically be the conclusion of my talk today. So, in order to understand how Netel operates, we need to take a look at browser helper, obje or browser helper objects, so-called BHOs. You can think of them as some kind of plug-in for Internet Explorer. So, they are a COM object, which is basically loaded by IE on startup. So, when Internet Explorer starts up, the, um, the registry key that's in italics is basically uh, accessed by IE. Within this registry key, you find several subkeys, and each of those subkeys is loaded as a plugin within IE. Uh, the file that's actually loaded by this registry key is referenced within another hive, which is in the second part of this slide. Um, and there you find basically the DLL that's then loaded into uh, IE. Popular examples of BHOs are, for example, the Acrobat add-in, <coughs> with which you can um, observe. Uh, with which you can watch Acrobat uh, files within your browser, the Google toolbar, or there are hundreds of other toolbars which are also all implemented as a BHO. So per, um, BHOs are not malicious per se, but on the other side, they can be abused quite easily. Uh, because they have an interesting feature, they can register to several browser events. For example, they can register to something like document complete, which means that the document has completely loaded. Or another event is before navigate, which is basically sent before 
the browser uh, starts to uh, open a connection to another site in order before it starts loading. Uh, there are other events that can also uh, be registered, and then you get a call back each time one of those events fires. And another interesting property of BHOs is that they can access and modify the whole DOM tree, which basically means they can modify in an arbitrary way the website you currently see. For example, they can inject new fields within your web page, they can read out the content of the website, things you have entered in boxes and all these kind of things. So, so from an um, attacker's point of view, they are really valuable since they allow an attacker to basically observe everything you type into a website, which is basically the perfect starting place for uh, malware. Uh, NetL itself is um, yeah, implemented as such a BHO. Here are some, uh, some, yeah, some characteristics. For example, it drops with several files under C Windows System 32. Uh, for example, lm.dat, which is the config file, which specifies which URLs should be observed. And then each time the victim goes to one of those URLs, the BHO starts to record all the information you enter on those sites. So, for example, they configure the, uh, the you know, the malware to observe all access to, let's say, postbank.de, and then each time you go to postbank.de, the BHO starts to monitor everything you type into the web form. Um, there's a file called alog.txt, which stores all the information that's collected from the BHO. And the BHO itself uses varying names, for example, GCOM, the 32 DLL is something I've seen quite recently very often but they change this from time to time, so th you cannot fingerprint just based on the BHO name. Analysis is rather easy. Um, easiest way is probably with Oli. Um, basically, you take a VMware, infect your Internet Explorer, then attach with Oli, and then you can, within Oli, just attach to the BHOs that are loaded, and then you can see what the BHO is doing. I have some screenshots, so probably you cannot see this in the back, but I have some you still cannot see it in the back, but uh, I will upload the slides just after my talk um, and just explain what you see here. So this is basically uh, the code you see in Oli, and here we see something like um, a file name, in this case C Windows System32 lm.dat, which references the config file that's loaded up on startup, uh, then a few, yeah, a bit later in within the code, you see a URL, in this case, uh, sendliman.cn slash sdt.php, so this provides us with a domain name, which is probably the drop zone, so this is the URL that we're interested in, since this is the, the drop server, so the server where the keylogger sends the stolen information to. And if you analyze the code a bit further, you see that an HTTP connection is established to this domain, and then it posts data to that domain. If we go to this specific URL, we see at first nothing, so it's just a just an empty page. So we see just a placeholder and nothing else. But if we play a bit, for example, if we go to slash admin.php, then you see something like please log in, and it asks for a login and password. So this seems to be the yeah, the access point with, with, with which the attacker can access all data that's stolen here. Okay, then some miracle occurs that I cannot reveal too much details what we do then, um, since yeah, if I talk too much about this, the attackers will figure out what we do and then they can close the things that are still open for them. So therefore, uh, I refrain from revealing too much details, especially since it's also videotaped and available on the internet. If you want to have details, just, just talk to me afterwards during a beer or something like that. So, um, yeah, so a miracle occurs and we somehow get access to the log files that are behind the drop zone. Uh, this is an example of how such a log file looks like. So, as, uh, these are actually three different logs uh, within one. So, on the first line we see a timestamp. So, this was recorded at a victim's machine at the uh, 8th of July 2008, somewhere in the evening, we see three different uh, entries within, lo within the log file. It's always login.live.com, which is the main site when you go 
to live.com and when I log in, all data, so all authent authentication is handled by this specific URL. Uh, then we see um, here in yellow a few interesting things. So the, key, the BHO basically reports that it has locked some keys, it has read out some keys. Um, I've obfuscated this a bit in order to not reveal too much information about the victim, but we see that the user entered some kind of login, and as a login it was an email address, and then he used the password, which seems to be rather strong, so it has digits, it has um, uppercase and also lowercase characters, so it seems to be a rather strong password. And then in the third uh, request, we see everything in clear text again, so the login and the password. So the BHO has basically observed that the victim went to login.live.com, the victim tried to log in, the BHO had access to the whole DOM tree, was able to read everything what the victim entered, and then this information was sent to the drop zone, and the attacker has basically all information that's needed to impersonate as this particular victim. <coughs> Other information that's read out by uh, Natel is, for example, the protected storage. So each time you go to a website and have this autosave feature, so if the browser basically stores the information you entered, so that next time you visit the website, it's basically read out of some kind of internal cache. This is actually the protected storage. Uh, yeah, so Natel has the possibility to also read the protected storage, so for example, uh, if you store the uh, authentica authentication credentials for your banking account within IE, th those can be read out. If you store your passwords within Outlook, those can be read out and all these kind of things. Um, so autocomplete password is the other example where the attacker also gets information about another live.com account. And the third type of information that's typically stolen are cookies. So the BHO also reads out all cookies that are stored on your local disk and also transmits them to the victim since there are also several websites that do cookie-based authentication, so they also steal cookies. Um, some versions of NetHell also have the possibility to steal certificates or they also have the possibility to defeat visual keyboards. So if you do not enter your um, credentials via the keyboard, since you've uh, since you feel key loggers, but then you have some kind of visual keyboard where you just click with your mouse the information that should be entered. Basically what they do is they just take a screenshot around your mouse click and then send this screenshot to the drop zone so that they can also observe uh, what you clicked. So basically, yeah, they own you in different ways. Uh, so this was NetHell. It's, it was a rather simple one, so it's just a BHO probably just a few thousand lines of code, not too advanced. Uh, even on MSDN you find um, basically the code needed to start a BHO, so it's not that hard to basically get started in this area. NetHell is, from a technical point of view, not that advanced. But more advanced is Zeus, our second example. Um, actually, up to now, up to now oh, sorry, uh, the first version actually used this VSN poem uh, directory within uh, Windows System 32, and therefore another name for this is WSN Poem, and Zbot is the name given by several virus vendors. So actually up to now there are three different versions out there. Um, it's very characteristic for each version. They use a different uh, file name for the main executable. So Entos EXE was the first version, then we have OEM BIOS EXE, which was the second, and recently, so a couple of months ago actually, uh, they used this tracks.exe. So those are the three main lines of this uh, particular malware. Furthermore, it drops several other files within System32. For example, entos.exe also drops audio and video DLL. So it's pretty characteristic. So once you have, um, once you see an infected system, it's pretty easy to spot the actual infection steps. Um, so what SOIS does is they do not uh, implement the BHO, so, so they do not inject, um, they do not um, append to Internet Explorer, but what they do is they inject themselves into several system processes within the s uh, Windows environment. For example, they inject themselves into services EXE and some other system processes so that they can then observe 
everything what, uh, what's handled by those processes. They have some interesting features, for example, they also implement some kind of form crabbing. So each time you go on a website, they also pass the DOM tree and um, basically identify each form field within the HTML document and then read out this form field, transmit it to the drop zone. They can also inject arbitrary HTML code. So for example, what's quite popular is uh, for a banking website, they inject additional HTML code so that new form fields are seen by the victim that ask, for example, uh, transaction numbers or other things. Or they inject other forms, for example, to ask for a social security number, for a credit card number. So in arbitrary websites, uh, probably the interesting thing I heard in this area was uh, one victim which was also infected with, with Zeus, where the attackers injected 10 additional fields which asked for TAN numbers. And then the victim received several mails each uh, on a particular day. And then in the afternoon, he called his bank and said, I'm out of TAN numbers, please send me more. Because <laughs> he, uh, he entered so many. So. But probably these are the kind of people that we cannot protect um, at uh, any kind of time. Um, so it also has the possibility to steal certificates, so they have um, a similar yeah, feature set as also NetHell, but from a technical point of view it's more interesting since it injects into all processes that are available and then reads out from them uh, the interesting information. Um, another interesting feature is also HTML parsing, so for several banking websites they have also implemented that uh, once the victim logs in, they can also pass the HTML code and extract information about the balance of the bank account. So, and this information about the balance is then also sent to the drop zone so that the attacker can easily see which bank account is interesting and which not. Within the log files, which I'll talk later about, we found, for example, 25 victims uh, that were infected this way and in total, they had more than $120,000 on their accounts. So it seems like you know, an attacker can have access to quite a bit of money there. Some other characteristics is that they use a very characteristic mutex name. It's always underscore, underscore, system, underscore, underscore, and then some other numbers. Um, so this is a rather generic way and also to also detect choice. Uh, probably the best overview of how to analyze SOIS is available in a paper by Frank Boldevin, uh, reconstructor.org, where he um, basically showed with complete source code of how SOIS can be unpacked, of how it can be analyzed, and it's available at his website. Uh, again, we get somehow access to the log files, and this is an example of how the log files from SOIS look like. Um, in the first line, it's just a version number, so each, uh, each build basically has a new version number. We see the system time, so it's middle of June 2008. Uh, the victim is logged in since five minutes, so it's just connected to the internet. Uh, the version number is Windows, so it's XP, Service so Pack 2. Language 1033 is, I think, US. So it has an English user interface, and then we see Zeus is injected into IE Explorer Excel, so within Internet Explorer. And in this case, it observed a login to Wachovia, so one of the yeah, major banks within the US. We see again that the keystrokes are locked, so all keystrokes, the victim types, are basically locked and sent to the drop zone. And in the lower part, we also see that the user ID and the password are also correct, so this is basically uh, yeah, stolen bank accounts, so a complete Vachovia account is stolen in this case. Other type of information extracted by NetHell, uh, but sorry, sorry, is again the protected storage. So in this case, we see um, Zeus is injected into services EXE, and from there it reads out the protected storage. For example, uh, yeah, username and password for Com Comcast, and an AOL account. So if you compare this to phishing, where the attacker can only basically get one credential from yeah, one site, with a keylogger he can get lots of credentials just from the protected storage or from the browsing behavior of the victim. 
And the third type of information stored by choice are, again, cookies. So they also read out all cookies and send this information to the drop zone. So these are the, the two uh, main families of malware that we analyzed uh, as part of the study. But there are many others out there. Just to mention a few uh, topics, Xenobar and Maproot, uh, probably one of the most advanced malware binaries we currently see in the wild. What this malware, for example, does is it modifies the MBR, so in order to also stay or to be loaded early on during the boot process. They also uh, have some other interesting tricks, uh, and they also have the pos possibility to lock um, banking websites. So each time when you're infected, go to a banking website, probably your credentials are stolen. And since I think a week or so, uh, topic is also active again, so they were gone for several weeks, but since about one week they are active again and spreading their malware. Then Banka or Bankos, it's pretty popular within South America, so there are many different families or many different versions within Brazil. What they do is, from the feature point of view, they have um, yeah, not as many features as Toys and NetHell, but um, yeah, it's nevertheless effective, especially since there are so many different versions out there. What they do is they send the credentials via email back to the attacker. So they don't use a drop zone, but send all stolen information via email out. Um, yeah, Silent Bank is another one. Or recently, um, an antivirus company detected what they uh, termed Chrome Inject. Basically, it was a Firefox plugin. Uh, so it was a plugin for Firefox, which was supposed to also lock keystrokes to banking websites. So it had a, also a config URL or config file in which several banking websites were referenced. During a workshop recently, we also analyzed Chrome Inject, but it seems like the sample is actually broken, so it doesn't work in the wild, actually. But yeah, now it also makes sense, since Firefox is getting more and more market share, it also makes sense to target Firefox and not only IE. Okay, so this was an overview of different kinds of keyloggers that are out there. Um, we covered, I think, six or so, two of them in more detail for more uh, briefly, but there are also many others out there, so um, the threat is real and there are many of these malware families that basically try to get your credentials just via logging keystrokes. So, uh, basically, the start of our research was then, how can we find the drop zones in an automated way, and how can we m learn more about what they are doing? So, to come back to um, the initial slide, this is how the uh, banking malware works from a technical kind of point of view. So, the attacker sends the keylogger to the victim. This can be by email, as we've seen uh, during the motivation. It can be via drive-by downloads. So, these are malicious websites. And if you go to such a website and your browser is not patched to the latest uh, patch level, then the website basically attacks your browser and via the vulnerability within your browser, they install malware on your system. Uh, yeah, and then basically the keylogger infects the victim's machine, observes the credentials and sends them to the drop zone as we've seen during the examples. So what we now do is we use the concept of so-called honeypots in which we basically have systems that are deliberately vulnerable. So we pretend to be a victim, but we have especially prepared systems with which we basically attract malicious traffic to our honeypot. And this is a system that can be compromised since, since we closely monitor it and then observe what the attacker is doing with the system that we control. You can think of it as some kind of uh, yeah, basically closely monitored systems which we uh, infect with the keylogger and then monitor what's happening there. Last year, we also published a book in this area uh, in which we basically talk more about uh, different kinds of honeypots. It's called virtual honeypots. If you're interested, just get the book. <coughs> okay, so with honeypots, in the first phase, we use them in order to collect samples. So we want to get the target of attacks. So we want to get infected. We want to attract keyloggers. And we use different, uh, yeah, different types of honeypots. On the one hand, we use so-called client-side honeypots. Basically, you can think of them as being a machine that has a vulnerable version of Internet Explorer. Probably also some plugins are installed that are vulnerable. So, for example, an older version of the Ecobit plugin 
or some other um, yeah, older BHOs that have vulnerabilities, and then you automatically surf the web. So you go to a website, wait for a couple of seconds, go to the next website, wait for a couple of seconds, and then go to the next. And in the meantime, you also observe the system state so that you can detect if the website you just visited wants to exploit your system. Uh, for example, there are many uh, gaming websites, or wallpaper websites, also porn websites that are malicious and that use so-called drive-by downloads to compromise your systems. If we uh, find such a website, basically the client side Honeypots uh, detects that it's attacked and then also extracts from the changes to the system also the malware binary. So then we get the key login in an automated way. Um, I just mentioned a few systems that are available. All of them are open source. At our lab, we use uh, seven instances of Capture HPC, which constantly surf the web, um, and we can analyze a couple of hundred or a couple of thousands sites per day, and then regularly find new malware with this kind of client-side honeypots. Another interesting way to get attacked is just spam traps. So just collect spam and then watch for the attachments. As we've seen earlier on, this UPS mail, uh, basically just get the attachment and the attachment already contains the keylogger. Or if the spam mail contains a link, we just follow the link with a honey client and then we go to the website and see whether the website wants to attack us. So this is the way in order to, or the way we use in order to collect samples. We also have quite a lot of user submissions to a site that I mentioned in the next slide. So there we get constantly new malware. So currently I think we have more than 400,000 binaries within our database. In the second phase, we analyze those malware binaries that we've collected with the help of our honeypots. Uh, we use a tool called CW Sandbox, which was developed um, as part of a diploma thesis and then now Carsten, he's um, a PhD student also at our lab. So he works on the system since more than two years. And the basic idea is that we have the malware sample, we execute it within a controlled environment, and then closely observe during runtime what the malware is doing. For example, what files are created, what registry keys are changed, or what network communication <coughs> the malware initiates. Um, and then CW Sandbox basically does this observation, and after a certain timeout, it generates an analysis report in XML format so that we can then also process via other tools. Uh, we have a public front end at cwsandbox.org where you can just submit samples. So if you have a suspicious file, which can be either an executable or now we also support PDF files, just submit them to us and then within a couple of minutes you should receive an analysis report which basically contains the information we observed while running the particular sample that you sent to us. Um, besides doing this monitoring, we also need to do some other things. For example, uh, because not all keylogger samples immediately access the drop zone. For example, they can have a hard-coded config, so the, um, the keylogger knows already what kind of sites should be observed, or uh, the keylogger only contacts the drop zone once it has found something interesting. So once it has found some credentials, only then those credentials are sent to the drop zones. Another thing is that BHOs are only started uh, when IE starts up. So we need to actually start IE in order to see what the BHO is doing. Um, and therefore, basically what we have implemented is some kind of uh, yes, emulation of human behavior. So basically we do what a normal user does. So we go to, set to websites, for example, we go to uh, WebDE and then log in there with a username and a password. We also enter credentials in websites, we can send out emails, we can do basically what a typical user also does uh, in order to basically trick the victim into uh, thinking that a real human is doing something. Question. What are the life cycles of these systems? Oh, sorry. Uh, the life cycle of those systems, what systems? Yeah, so typically those systems are resetted either when we detect um, a malicious website, so once we are exploited, yeah, that's the only then, yeah. And how do you simulate the logging in of, to say, like a bank, like a, say, Wachovia, for example? 
For example, PostBank.de, they have a demo account where you can basically go there and do transactions. Um, and we also, yeah, basically what we did, we developed a tool that basically does this based on AutoIt, which is a scripting language. We have 17 behavior templates that do typical things like go to a website, log in, uh, send an email, do something else. And then those can be combined in an arbitrary way in order to basically do whatever you want to do. Uh, we'll release this next year, hopefully, under GPL. Uh, and what we also do within this, uh, our analysis environment is we deposit some credentials within the protected storage in order to offer some more bait to the keylogger. Um, this is an example of such a CW sandbox report. Uh, again, probably you cannot see it in the back, but I'll explain it. So we see um, different things, like for example, the yeah, file changes, so which uh, files are changed, the registry changes, and most interesting is what on this, is on this slide, the network activity. For example, we see that the malware tries to download from a specific URL a file, or later on it posts some data to a specific URL. And this is then probably the, the drop zone, since the data are posted from the infected machine to another site, and that's exactly what the uh, drop zone looks like. If we go to this URL, again, we see a, an empty site. In this case, we need to go to a slash in.php. And again, we see some kind of login formula. In this case, it's choice. Then again, some magic appears. And then we get the credentials that we've also seen earlier on. So in the first phase, we automatically get the malware samples. In the second phase, we do the um, dynamic analysis together with the user simulation. And then in the third phase, when we know where the drop zone is located, we have a monitoring system which basically periodically contacts the drop zone and then retrieves information from there in different ways. We've completely automated all those steps. Uh, we analyzed about 2,000 banking trojans with CW sandbox between April and October. Uh, in total, we found more than 140 NetHell and more than 200 choice drop zones. In the meantime, we have uh, even more, so now we have more than 300 of those drop zones in total. And for a little bit more than 70 of those, we got complete access to the drop zone. So we got complete access to all data that's stored in the drop zone. In total, these were 33 gigabyte of data, so just whatever the victims entered on websites and then protected storage, cookies and all this kind of information uh, yeah, we got in our collection system. In total, we had information about more than 170,000 victims, so quite a lot of infected systems are out there. Um, yeah, just a disclaimer, so of course the information that we collected during the study is very sensitive. So this contains passwords from users, it contains bank account information, and similar, very sensitive information. So handle this with care. Uh, unfortunately, we are not in a position to inform each victim since we are just a university. And therefore, we had a collaboration with AustSAT, which is the third so computer emergency response team of Australia, with whom we have a longer relationship especially in the area of honeypots, and they, they can take care of this data, so they have a notification system. So we handed over this 33 gigabyte of data to them, and then they notified the victims. So since we cannot do it, they <coughs> did the job for us. Okay, so we have now this data and now some, some statistics. So in order to learn what the attackers are doing, what kind of information they are stealing, and yeah, what they can do with our stolen data. Uh, in the beginning, just a few examples. So this is just an overview of what amount of data was stolen in the individual drop zones. Uh, these are the top three drop zones where we found um, between a few gigabyte and a few hundred megabytes of data. The number of victims was between 20,000 and 10,000 for each single drop zone. The drop zones themselves were located typically either in Asia, in Russia, or also within the US some also within Europe, so it's rather diverse. There's no single country, no single autonomous system that's yeah, most prevalent, so it's pretty diverse, the whole threat. What's also interesting is the lifetime, so how long the individual drop zones are online. 
Uh, in total, we have about 60 days, so about two months, that each drop zone is online. So the time we first find it until it goes offline. So two months in which the attackers can basically just collect information from this one drop zone. Um, this figure basically shows where the victims are located. So the 160,000 Nittel victims um, on the x-axis you see the IP space, so all IP addresses. On the y-axis, the number of victims in a cumulative distribution. And you see that there are only two basically network ranges in which most of the victims are located. So these are the typically the dial-up ranges where basically your mother or your grandma basically clicks on a link and then their information are stolen. Some statistics for choice. There we have found only about 10,000 <laughs> infected machines. Uh, here we get an overview of what kind of operating system they are running. So most of the machines are running on the latest patch level. So XP Service Pack 2 was the latest patch level during most of the time of the study. So we saw that most people were patched, but they failed to do basic security measurements. So they clicked on the links, they opened the attachments, and then they were infected. So patches don't help always. If you want to infect the victim, just do social engineering and do not exploit uh, vulnerabilities. Um, these are basically the banking targets. So what kind of banks are the typical targets by the keyloggers? Here we see, for example, Volksbanken, or also Fiducia, relative, uh, so very high within the statistics. This is basically due to the fact that um, I think they tested most of the stuff in Germany, and um, those, especially Fiducia, is some kind of provider that does the banking infrastructure for many banks within Germany. Um, OSMP is something similar within Russia. And then we see uh, ABN AMRO and Santana, which are basically big banks within Spain and the Netherlands, which are the typical targets. Some statistics for the stolen credentials. Um, first, we start with the Anacon prices, which this is taken from a study by Symantec. Uh, other antivirus vendors also periodically, so typically every six months or every year, they do a very similar study um, where they basically publish what a certain credential costs on the underground market. For example, a bank account typically costs between ten and one thousand dollar. Credit cards are rather cheap, between forty cent and twenty dollars. The identities are a bit higher priced. Online auction site passwords, and then yeah, you see the prices. So this is basically what something, or what a stolen credential is worth on the underground market. Just to give you an overview of how valuable something is. We will later on use this uh, table for some comparisons. So we have those 33 gigabytes of data, and now the challenge is how do we find the credentials? So how do we know what's interesting? So what is actually a username? What is a password? Since we want to do this in a rather generic way. Um, fortunately, NetHell helps us here, since NetHell, as we've seen earlier on, it basically always annotates, once it's found something, it annotates it with the key locked and the keys read keywords. And then if we search in this line, we see, okay, for login.live.com, password is the form field name that's interesting for us. So we just search for this keys read, key locked, and then we find out, okay, for login.live.com, password is an interesting field since the keylogger used, uh, since the keylogger uh, observed th this particular HTML form. And we use this kind of information in order to build site-specific models. So for the different websites, we basically build a model which basically tells us for a given URL which form fields are interesting. So for example, I hope you can read this also later um, in the back. For login.live.com, we find out that the form fields login and password are interesting since they contain the username and also the password. Or for paypal.com, uh, the field names are login underscore email and login underscore password. Uh, yeah, and we use this in order to build, I think, more than 500,000 models for the different URLs we've seen during our study. So for each URL, we now know which form fields are interesting. This helps us then, for example, to observe what kind of banks are typically targeted. So for example, we found about 2,200 PayPal accounts, so username, password, 
with which an attacker can then log in and do melee transactions since there's no really security measurements within PayPal. Um, the other top banks that were targeted are commonly banks within American-speaking countries since those countries typically do not have a really good uh, security system like we have in Germany with our transaction numbers. And in total, we found more than 10,000 different uh, bank accounts and if you remember, 25 bank accounts had a total of $120,000, so we can imagine that 10,000 accounts have probably a bit more money on them. For credit cards, we use a different trick. Uh, basically, a credit card can be verified with the so-called Loon, uh, Loon algorithm, sorry, which is a basic, uh, very simple checksum to verify whether a given number is a valid credit card number. So it's a very easy way to uh, validate um, a given number. It's not uh, designed in order to be something like a hash, but more like uh, to protect against accidental errors. Um, so you can have false positives via just applying Moon algorithm, but it helps you in order to get a rough overview of whether or not something is um, a possible um, credit card number. It's just the code, so no. But just skip this. Um, so in total, we found a couple of thousand also uh, credit card numbers, about 3,000 Visa, 1,400 MasterCard passwords, uh, sorry, credit card numbers, uh, and then lots of others. So it also seems to be rather efficient in order to use keyloggers to steal this kind of information. What is more interesting is um, that the attackers also quite often steal information from other sites. Um, this is Alexa. Alexa is a website that basically has a popularity measurement. So um, they have some techniques in order to estimate how popular a given website is. For example, uh, from the top 50 Alexa sites, 18 are portals like live.com or webmail providers like Gmail. Um, so these are the main popular sites that the users use on the internet. And we also see uh, that those sites are the typical targets of stolen credentials. So we found more than 66,000 different live.com accounts. So this was basically the biggest uh, website that we've seen where accounts were stolen. We also saw lots of Yahoo accounts or Mail.yahoo or Rampla, which are uh, more popular within Russia. We also tens of thousands of accounts were stolen via the credit card uh, via the keyloggers. Another popular type of uh, websites are social networking sites or sites with a social component, like, for example, YouTube or Facebook or those other social networks. Uh, there we found lots of Facebook accounts, high five, so the bigger uh, sites, also StudiVZ for Germany, but then um, within uh, Poland or Russia, we also found the top social networks with lots of stolen uh, credentials. Since I have only 10 minutes, I skip over those two slides. Um, just some slides on protection. So how can you protect yourself against this kind of threats? So the typical security measurements also apply for keyloggers. Just patch quickly once a new patch is available. So um, because the attack vector are typically something like trust by downloads or social engineering. Against trust by downloads, you can protect yourself with the help of updates if it's not a zero day, of course. Uh, and social engineering, you yeah, need some more security awareness. So this is the other thing. Do not click on suspicious links, since this is something you would all also do not do in reality. So be more security aware. Also do not open suspicious attachments, since as we've seen earlier on, all those attachments are also quite often malicious and contain the keylogger. Um, antivirus software can only help you to a uh, limited extent. For example, here we have a report with VirusTotal, which scans with 38 virus scanners. In this case, 28 from the 38 uh, antivirus scanners detected this as uh, here's Zwot. Um, all the major ones, like Kaspersky, McAfee, Systematic, uh, detected the threat. Only the smaller ones, they failed a bit. Uh, but yeah, they give you some kind of basic protection. But on the other hand, there are also other examples. For example, this was scanned uh, and only two from 34 antivirus vendors detected. 
But if we run this within CW Sandbox, we see again this antos.exe audio and video DLL. So this is clearly also Zbot, but only two from 34 and diverse engines correctly identify this as such. Mm. For protecting your bank accounts, so you notice that you can do safe transactions. I think within Germany we have a rather good protection system. Uh, for example, many banks offer thumbs, something like mobile TAN, which basically looks like the following. Each time you do a transaction, um, you get a confirmation SMS, so um, confirmation on your phone, which basically lists the amount you want to transfer, the, the target bank account, and then you get a transaction number. And you need to enter this trans transaction number during um, your bank transaction, and only if the, if this information is correct, then, you, then the money is actually transferred. So this helps since you have a second channel. Uh, some banks also use index TAN, the so-called I-10. Uh, this cannot actually be considered secure anymore since we've also seen malware that basically does in the browser attacks. So within the browser, they modify the visuals in such a way that the amount is transferred to another account but the user doesn't see anything. So everything looks all right, but in the background, everything is transferred to another account, and we've seen malware that basically does this on the fly. So index time doesn't help you, but mobile time, and everything that has some kind of two-factor authentication also helps here. Okay, summary, my last two slides. Um, there are many different kinds of banking trojans out there, so we studied in detail just two, but there are tens of families out there, so probably this is just a, just a rough overview I provided today, um, but the threat is real, so there are different kinds of banking malware out there. They're getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, with the techniques that we, have, that we are using, with the automated collection of malware and then automated analysis, um, we can find the drop zones in an automated way, and then with the monitoring system, we also get a better overview of uh, yeah, what's located on the drop zone, because then we get at least a rough overview of what the underground economy looks like, so what kind of information is stolen, uh, what can an attacker potentially earn. And question we still have is how representative is the study we did, since we had more than 340 drop zones and only 70 of them where we had complete access. So as you see, it's not very much that we actually see. So is this only the top of the iceberg, the 170,000 victims, or how many victims are out there? So this is something I don't have a good answer to, so, but I guess that there are hundreds of thousands of victims infected with keyloggers where all their uh, personal information are stolen. Um, last week we published a paper, it's available at honeyblog.org, which is my blog. Uh, where you get more information about, uh, or more, more details about the things I talked about today, so more statistics, uh, better overview of the things we did there. Uh, it's available at my blog, where you can also find out more about honeypots and other things. And then a few people helped, so Carsten developed the sandbox, uh, Markus helped in user simulation, Felix Freiling is my advisor, Frank helped with the soy stuff, uh, Osford took care of the notification process. So many people who also helped in the study and whom I would like to thank. And now we have five minutes left for your questions. <laughs> Okay, we start at the front and I uh, slowly work myself at the back, if that's okay. We have another mic at the back, that's great. Well, probably a slightly late. Hello? Yeah, okay. Well, um, thanks for uh, that uh, small piece of undocumented miracle that you have done to break into the, these, these uh, uh, collectors. Um, Actually, we didn't break into them, so we, we didn't use any vulnerabilities, so. Okay. It was just um, 
So I, I remember that uh, about 10 years ago, Microsoft has announced that they are going to, to um, release Internet Explorer for Linux. I'm still waiting for this, and whenever they, they do it, I'm, s I'm starting using it, because I love to live in uncertainty, life is dangerous. But I have configured a Macintosh for, for my mother and a uh, Ubuntu system for my daughter. The question is, are they safe? Is my family safe? Uh, is there a known vulnerability to um, Firefox or to Safari? Or is it all um, restricted to Internet Explorer? And also, for example, with Chrome Inject that we've seen recently, this was supposed to basically also attack Firefox. So I think if Firefox gets more market share, then this will be the next target. And if you take a look at the security updates that Apple gets each month. So if you have to install 300 megabytes of updates each month, then I'm, I'm not really convinced that the Mac is actually really secure. So I think we'll also see attacks against those platforms. But not known yet. Uh, not, no, not yet, but if it makes sense later on. OK. Um, sorry. How many logins to porn sites did you find during your research? Yeah, we didn't study that. What? What? Sorry? <laughs> we didn't study that. We, I, I talked about these things we did here. So. But there are many of those, so, yeah. Was there, was there any ma malware which was distributed as a Firefox add-on on add-ons Mozilla.org? Chrome Inject. I talked about this briefly. So there's, I think, only this one sample that I know of. But, but was it distributed on the official site? Uh, no, no, it, it was, uh, I don't know what the attack vector was. I got the sample from a different way, but it was not on the official site, but somewhere else, I think. So downloading, uh, can uh, downloading uh, add-ons from add-ons Mozilla.org can be assumed to be safe? <laughs> Probably, so I don't know. Testing? Oh, uh, uh, have you seen any, uh, any attacks against two-factor authentication, specifically those with the, where you enter the amount into the, the token? Uh, no, actually not. I think those systems are considered secure now. All those two-factor authentication where you enter your card or that does other things. Actually, I think we didn't see any attacks against those systems. Um, I talked about briefly about M10. I think this is probably the most secured system we have nowadays. So. Um, I'm going to hand over the microphone. If you could, if uh, the person talking just could just stand up so it's easier to locate them in the room, that'd be great. Um, talk about okay. Uh, just one brief question uh, uh, to the last one. Uh, you said it was recently safe. So what about uh, systems that use like uh, an encryption file on disk that is encrypted by a password? Many banks still give that out instead of a dedicated card reader uh, to use with an online banking software. So um, I would assume that if you could just lock the password, of course that would need uh, knowledge about the respective uh, application because it's not just Internet Explorer, it's a random browser. But uh, given a, an attack vector that would like read the file and lock the password, which you would need, um, is there anything you found in that region or do you think it's even worth doing that given it's so trivial phishing uh, accounts of the web browser? Uh, I think we didn't see the specific kind of attacks, but I think um, if you just keep this on disk, you have the problem that within the browser it's still in key text. So, and then this is the point where the keylogger basically craps the information. So, you still lost this credentials. You talked of the targeted sites. Uh, how did they were targeted by the crime criminals by special features of the malware, or or it's just the popular by the victims? So what you meant the main targeted sites? Uh, the main targeted sites, um, basically each keylogger has a configuration file and within the configuration file the attacker specifies which websites should be observed and this was the statistic about okay. this config URLs. Are those public? Uh, Are those lists of the, in the configuration files public? Are they on your blog somewhere? Um, not really public. I don't know whether we can share this kind of info, but for example, Trustier, 
www.google.com, they have um, a search engine where you can basically enter a given domain name and then they tell you whether they saw attacks against this particular domain. So trustheer.com. Uh, did you do some, some uh, search on the owners of the drop zones? Some, did you find some patterns? or? Uh, this was rather diverse. So as I said during the talk, we saw many different autonomous systems. I think there were three autonomous systems that were pretty popular. Uh, but typically they had different um, who is information. So it was rather diverse and a really single large organization. Uh, because basically all the um, keyloggers I talked about, they can be purchased on the Anacond market as a basically some package. So you can purchase toys for I think $2,000. Then you get basically a builder which builds you a new malware sample, so a new keylogger. You get the web front end that I've, pre uh, I've shown briefly. And the only thing you need then to do is basically spread the malware and then you have started everything. Okay. Hello. Um, you have talked about probable and possible profit. Uh, have you any actual idea how much real damage was done? Um, we don't have insights into the actual damage. We can only do some estimations. Let's see. This is the slides I skipped. Um, okay, we come back to this slide now. Uh, basically, this uh, just for three different drop zones for which we had continuous data for more than four weeks. Um, basically, the amount of credentials stolen per day. So we have um, some, drop, some drop zones which receive more than 100 or through 200 fresh credentials per day. And this is just an overview for three of those. And um, so this just shows for a given day of how many new credentials were stolen by this specific drop zone. Oh shit, sorry. Um, and then, do, 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 it's now I need to get back to my presentation. And then, if you take the, uh, the figure from Symantec, where they have the market prices, so you have, um, and then multiply the credential with the market price, you get this kind of figure. So, if we found, for example, um, a keylogger and uh, um, a credit card, then we multiply this by 40 cent. If we found a banking website, uh, we multiply this by $10. And this figure then shows you the estimated daily earning or the potential earning of, a key of the drop zone owner per day. So they can earn a couple of hundred dollars per day if they would sell the credentials that are earned on a specific day. And uh, can you um, s say where the endpoints are? Like, uh, do they send the money to Nairobi or...? No, no we didn't examine this yet. Thank you. Hello. Uh, you mentioned that the drop zones have an average lifespan of about 60 days. I was wondering what happens to them at that point. Uh, they just go offline. So probably the provider just cuts them off or their law enforcement, they cut it off or something like that. Okay. Thanks a lot uh, also for the questions that we have. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time. Um, which is a shame because it's really interesting, but you might have some time after, afterwards on the Congress uh, uh, to find the answers. But thanks a lot for coming.